Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up to date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friends. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. A few weeks ago, I had the honor to interview the ninth United States Secretary of Veteran Affairs. Secretary and Dr. David Shulkin was born on an army base in Illinois, where his father served as a military psychiatrist. Upon his father's discharge, the family moved to Philadelphia, where his mother, a social worker, was from and where Dr. Shulkin would grow up. His career spans a number of decades working in private medical centers, but took a turn in 2015 when he was appointed by President Barack Obama as the United States Secretary of Veteran Affairs for Health. Two years later, in 2017, Dr. David Shulkin became Secretary Shulkin and served as the ninth United States Secretary of Veteran Affairs under President Donald Trump. Secretary Shulkin is known for tackling tough problems in our healthcare system and for his ability to turn around ailing hospitals and medical centers. Today, I speak with Secretary Shulkin about his experience working in private medical centers, as well as his time in the Veterans Administration Health System, ways we can improve our nation's mental and physical well-being, healthcare technology and innovation, and he shares some of his recommendations for how we can better serve those living with chronic pain. Okay, without further ado, let's begin and let's meet Secretary and Dr. David Shulkin. Hi there, Secretary Shulkin. Thanks for joining us this week on the Healing Pain Podcast. It's an honor to have you here. Oh, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to talk to you about some of your um, personal and professional history in health and medicine. Um, some of your work, of course, in the uh, private as well as the public sector. And then later on, talking about chronic pain and some ways we can start to address that more effectively as we move forward. Um, you know, when I look back at, at your history, people really know you in circles as someone who um, rehabilitated hospitals, if you will, um, going into major medical centers, a lot of them in the New York tri state area but other parts of the country as well. In 2014, you transitioned to government-based healthcare. Uh, President Obama appointed you and brought you in. I'm just wondering if you can tell us at that time, um, where were you working in the private sector and how did you prepare for that transition from private to more government-based healthcare? Well, uh, first of all, it's great to be with you. And I think you got a good summary of my career correct, which is I'm not the person to come in and to run an organization that's working smoothly. I'm not the guy to keep the, keep the operations going. I like challenges. I'm attracted to very mission-driven work that needs to be fixed. And fortunately in healthcare, there's no shortage of problems and ways that we can make our healthcare system work better for the average person. And that's, that's ultimately what what I'm about. In 2014, I was the CEO of Morristown Medical Center, which is in northern New Jersey. It's about a $1.3 billion organization that had a large tertiary acute hospital, a children's hospital, a rehabilitation hospital, several large integrated structures like accountable care organizations and physician groups. And I was um, working towards transitioning that health system into a value-based health system, trying to move towards better integration, uh, risk-based contracting, not because I thought that that was the most productive business model, but because I believed that an integrated approach towards healthcare delivery would improve the care of the populations that we served in Northern New Jersey. And at that point, I got a call from the White House, which, corresponded to what was happening. And I was watching on the television and reading in the newspapers when people read in newspapers in 2014 mm -hmm. uh, about what was called the wait time crisis, where literally hundreds of thousands of veterans were not able to get the appointments that they needed in the VA at a time that we were seeing pretty severely injured soldiers returning from overseas after horrific combat experiences and both the physical and emotional wounds of war. And the president, uh, President Obama at the time, asked me whether I would help him in coming into the VA healthcare system and fixing that problem. And I simply 
was not something that I was prepared to do, but knowing the experience that I had in healthcare, knowing that I like taking on difficult challenges because I think I'm good at it, I said, of course, I'll help you, Mr. President. And that started a process towards becoming a political appointee um, to lead the Veterans Health Administration. And you're coming into the largest healthcare system in the United States of America, which is no small um, feat for someone who's been in the private sector. How did you start to prepare and say, okay, I might be entering into a, a different game than I'm used to, so to speak? Yeah, I had no doubt that I did not understand government. And in fact, I think that was a deliberate choice of the president, which mm -hmm. was he did not want to replicate the current system and the current thinking that existed in government, because there were plenty of talented people with 400,000 employees in the Department of Veteran Affairs affiliated with every major academic medical center in the country. There were plenty of people who understood the VA system. I think that what he was looking for was somebody who understood the private sector, who would think about the problems that led towards the wait time crisis in a different way and come in and really challenge the system. Yeah. And so I was somewhat naive. I had not worked in a veterans affair since I was a resident in, in my medical training. Um, but I thought, hey, how difficult could this be? You know, I know the private sector healthcare, I've run a lot of organizations and people are people, and this is going to be pretty easy. In fact, um, I'm going to show the government just how efficient the private sector runs things. And I'm going to bring all the tools and tricks and experience I have to the VA and fix it. And of course, when I got there, it was exactly the opposite, which is the tools and techniques of the private sector do not translate uh, in an easy way into the government setting, that it's a whole different environment, a whole different culture and set of rules, and that if I wanted to be successful, I would need to really understand how the system worked and then understand how I could be helpful. So one of the ways I did that was, this won't surprise your audience, I put on my white coat, my stethoscope, and got right into the clinics, practicing first in Manhattan, in New York City at the VA, taking care of veterans. I wanted to see how the systems worked, how the patients felt about the system, how the healthcare professionals felt the system was allowing them to do what they knew how to do best. And I learned a lot. Uh, and at the same time, I deliberately kept my outsider hat on. I did mm -hmm not want to accept the ways that things were. I wanted to be a change agent because we were having a national crisis going on, this wait time crisis, and I was determined to fix that. And you did publish research after that where the primary aim, of course, with this wait time is the overall wait time. Um, primary care dermatology and cardiology significantly reduced their wait time through your efforts at the VA, which I think are really, is a really important point because some of those are especially primary care and cardiology are important services for many veterans. Yeah, uh, I actually focused on both primary care and mental health. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, the crisis in the VA at the time was both in physical illness and people not getting timely care and also in behavioral health issues. And, you know, these are what we call the invisible wounds of war where people were coming back and may have looked just fine from the outside, but inside there were issues. And the way that we saw that was that when I got to the VA, there were 22 veterans a day taking their life by suicide. And that really was in my mind, a national crisis of its own. And I made it the single top priority of, of the VA. The first thing I did was I set a goal not to continue the system of trying to give veterans appointments within 30 days, which is what the VA had in place. But I said, no, we're going to move towards same day appointments. If somebody has an urgent problem, whether it's a physical problem or an emotional problem, they need to be seen that day. And people thought I was crazy, but this is part of the strategy that I had, which is 
that you don't look for incremental improvement when you have big problems. Mm -hmm. You go for essentially what I call a moonshot or a big significant improvement. And for me, the only way I could assure the country and certainly the president that veterans weren't waiting for care unnecessarily was to say, we're going to see him that same day, Mr. President. And before President Obama left office in December of 2016, I went to the White House and said, Mr. President, I want to tell you, every VA medical center in the country now has same day appointments for both physical health and mental health. And that was the way I assured that we had fixed that problem. And a lot of that work that you did relied on integrating behavioral health into the primary care, primary care setting, which allowed people to access that in a way that was faster, right? Well, one of the things that I learned when I said that I was in some ways pretty naive thinking I'm going to teach the VA a lot of lessons from the private sector, it turned out to be exactly the opposite. I learned so many things from the VA that frankly, the private sector should be doing. So it was actually reverse. And one of those things was that the VA is free from a third party reimbursement system. In other words, as a private hospital CEO, when I ran hospitals like Beth Israel in New York or Morristown in New Jersey, I had to make sure that not only were we doing the right thing, but that we were going to be paid for it, else I wouldn't be in business very long. At the VA, I would go to Congress and I would say, I need a certain amount of money at the beginning of the year to take care of nine and a half million veterans who got care in the VA system. And they would pass a budget and I would get that money. And then I was allowed to spend the money in a way that I thought was responsible to take care of the country's veterans. I did not have to worry about submitting bills to commercial insurance companies. So that allowed us to do things like integrating behavioral health and primary care. So when you're a veteran and you see your primary care doctor, you're seeing them in a team of professionals. It's not a referral to go to another building and go see your psychiatrist or psychologist. Mm -hmm. It's all delivered as part of a cohesive team. And that helps improve access to care and helps prove, improve coordination of care. And it's very, very beneficial. But I was also able to do a number of other things to address the wait time crisis. The first is I pressed very hard on telehealth. Now, now that we're used to being in COVID, everyone understands, well, of course, telehealth. But back then, I had a wait time problem. I had to deliver care to veterans that lived hours away from a closest VA facility. And so I knew I needed to use technology. And when I talked about putting on my stethoscope, I soon added not only seeing patients in person in Manhattan, but I then began to take care of patients myself in Oregon from my office in Washington using telehealth. Mm. So I got to see firsthand how powerful this is. I ended up bringing my telehealth equipment to the West Wing of the White House demonstrating it to the patient, uh, to the president with my patients in Oregon. So I got his support for expanding telehealth. And we rapidly expanded telehealth back in 2017 before the pandemic to literally hundreds of thousands of veterans. I also gave advanced practice authority, independent practice authority to many non-physician licensed professionals. And I felt that if we were going to do the right thing for our veterans, assure access, I had to give nurses, independent practice authority, pharmacists, allow physical therapists, occupational therapists to be able to practice at the top of their license. Again, not a competition over reimbursement that you see in the private sector, mm -hmm. but what's the right thing to do for our patients? And how do you practice as a team of healthcare professionals? And that would allow our pharmacists to prescribe medications, which I think they do a terrific job of, and they ran their own clinics. Our nurses to be out there with their own primary care panels. Um, and so that was part of our strategy as well. That's a really big point that's going to resonate really with this audience as far as uh, supporting licensed health professionals across the board to uh, encourage them and enable them to practice at the top of their scope of practice, whether that be their personal scope of practice or whether that be their professional scope of practice. Because as you know, when you move, when you move into the private sector, there are turf wars and scope of practice battles. And 
there's a um, place for it where we obviously have to make sure that licensed health professionals have the skills, but there's also a part where it becomes uh, just, it keeps us stuck in a system that can't serve people the way we know we can on some level. That's right. And, and I will share with your audience that it was the single most controversial decision I, I did. Now I made lots of controversial decisions when I was in government, but I got 450,000 letters, emails, phone calls from people when I was going to make the decision about giving this additional practice authority to Mm non-physicians. And I will tell you that 50% of the calls I got were for it and 50% were against it. Mm -hmm. And I did not even realize at that time, I was somewhat new to politics, that there were doctors caucuses in Congress who wanted to assure I wouldn't do it. And there were nurses caucuses in Congress who wanted to assure that I would give practice authority. So basically, I did what felt natural to me is I made the decision not on who thought this was the right or wrong thing to do, but based on the principle. And the principle, if you recall, was that I was trying to solve veterans' wait time issues. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do it in a quality, responsible way. But throughout my career, I've always practiced with nurses and pharmacists and physical therapists and psychologists and felt very, very comfortable as a primary care doctor that I needed their help and that they often had more experience than I did in their areas of expertise. So I felt comfortable making that decision. Um, It was not received well by everybody, but I am confident it was the right thing to do for our veterans and the right thing to do for the country. Yeah, and it's interesting because you and I have been practicing long enough where we can remember the rise of nurse practitioners. At one point, there were no nurse practitioners. Sure. Over time, NPs have come in and they've taken somewhat of a primary care role in lots of different places and function well and provide quality care. Right. The physical therapy profession has gone through something similar, where now every university is a doctoral degree, obviously mm-hmm. licensed healthcare providers. There are multiple studies now showing that early access to physical therapy can positively impact things like opioid use disorder and opioid uh, use rates. How do we help my profession specifically, but I think this applies to a lot of other professions besides PT. How do we encourage or set PTs on the right path to help them work as primary healthcare providers in systems in the VA and maybe outside the VA, VA where they start serving in critical roles where they're missing pieces to uh, people's healthcare? Well, I think it's very important to continue to talk about the research that does demonstrate exactly the types of outcomes that you're talking about. And I think it's very important to be working in settings that support people who have the ability to contribute in the way that you're talking about, who want to practice in collaborative environments, who essentially want to be a valued member of the team. And I do think that we are in a very unique time where there are staffing shortages of people who are not feeling valued at where they work, have the ability to move. I think that we're at a time where there's a lot of potential disruption, whether it's using technology or different business models to change the way that healthcare is delivered so that people have more choice in the way that they access care. I think we're seeing this in physical therapy right now with the dramatic boom in the, ba- in, in the ability to bring physical therapy-based solutions directly to people in their homes using tele-physical therapy, using remote patient monitoring, mm-hmm. using you know, value-based reimbursement models. And certainly I think people understand the importance of prevention the way that you're talking about. So I think now is the right time to be able to make some significant advances in this area. When I look back into your history, you actually started a startup. I don't know if too many people know this, but you started a startup in the basement of your home um, that focused on values-based care years ago before values-based care was even a blip on anyone's radar. How did you come about that idea and where did that go? Because it seemed like it was a little bit before its time, although now it's really ripe for that um, type of approach in many healthcare models. Yeah, there, there's a warning in there for all, all your listeners who are thinking about doing a startup. It's 
it's great to be on the early side and to innovate and to be disruptive, but it's really important to be as successful to get timing right. Sometimes it's not good to be as early as it was. So, so when I was uh, leading health systems uh, and I was very focused in my initial part of my career, particularly on quality and patient safety, I saw that those hospitals and healthcare practitioners that focused on quality and safety were doing good, but they were not rewarded for it. In fact, there was actually a punitive measure in that if you focused on anything but volume, you actually ended up making less money. You were rewarded in a negative way. And so, so therefore, I felt that where the system needed to go was to be able to have a differential payment system to pay those that were providing higher quality of care more and those that were providing lower quality of care less. And the only way to do that would be to be able to measure that and to be able to differentiate between high quality practices and lower quality practices. And that was my initial startup using data that was publicly available as well as patient reported data to be able to differentiate high quality doctors, hospitals, and healthcare professionals from lower quality ones. And we were quite successful at that. But as you said, the market has taken about 20 years to catch up with where, where we were back then. And there's a lot of values-based uh, talk in the health, in the physical therapy industry specifically, yes. a lot of it around chronic lower back pain, because that's one area that we spend a lot of money and we should start to probably, uh, you know, award people who are delivering high value care um, that are changing people's quality of life versus lower value of passive treatments, which right. tend not to have good outcome studies, uh, outcomes. Um, you also are doing a lot of work in the digital health space. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you could really started when you were in the VA with telehealth before any of us in the private sector were using telehealth. Where do you see digital health going, I guess, for, you know, we can look at this from the perspective of just non-communicable diseases and overall health, mental health, chronic pain, which I know is a focus of yours as well. Yeah. Where do you, where do you see that heading? Well, I think, I don't think that you can generalize where, where it's heading. I think that you have to take it specifically. I think the area that is going to have the easiest time demonstrating the value and the improved outcomes with digital health is going to be in the behavioral healthcare space. I think that there, there is a preference for some patients, maybe many patients, to be able to have the interactions in a way that they feel more confidential, secure, ensures their privacy, and digital does that. Hmm. Where if you take many of the physical conditions, digital actually works against that. Where you're saying, although there may be in the physical illness uh, world, there may be good effectiveness data on digital therapeutics, but the engagement levels are really, really low. Less than 10% of people will follow through with the digital health plan. In behavioral, I think you're saying better follow through, better engagement. Uh, so, so one is, I don't think we should make generalizations, but the technology revolution that we're seeing, including digital health, I think is clearly here to stay. It was not a limited to a pandemic type environment. I think it's part of this whole transition from facility-based care, hospital, brick and mortar, to an environment that is much more uh, healthcare without any specific address, whether it's your home, your work, uh, you know, when you're traveling. And I think that type of convenience and access is something that consumers, patients like you and I are not going to want to see go away. I also think that as we begin to see more um, the ability to actually have real use cases for artificial intelligence, predictive analytics to make us smarter about our decision points, to have a learning system type environment, the more value we're going to replace, we're going to place on that and not be willing to let that go either. Uh, going to your doctor and hoping that they read last month's journal or that they remember something from six years ago that they might have learned uh, is probably not the best way to do something. It'd be like going on an airplane and saying, you don't need radar because you've flown to Atlanta before to the pilot. 
you know, yeah, that's true, but it doesn't mean that they're going to get there with the precision of radar. And so, so um, I think that um, digital health is going to continue to evolve and improve and um, is, is going to be the way that we're going to be delivering care for the future. So you mentioned the, the distinction between physical health and the behavioral health space. And it makes sense that behavioral health may have an easier time having a positive impact. Chronic pain is interesting because it kind of straddles both, right? There's definitely that psychological behavioral health element and there's a physical element to it as well. Do you yeah. see that as an area where we just need to do more research around and see how it goes and develops? Or do you see it fitting more into a, a behavioral health approach for someone's care, let's say? Yeah, I see it. I see it more on the behavioral health side, but but let me just say chronic pain is is a particularly important area to focus on. One is because much like the pandemic, right before the pandemic started, we had our own essentially public health crisis with chronic pain. And it was, of course, the opioid, um, the opioid crisis. And that that was very similar to the pandemic in that literally overnight people stopped writing prescriptions for opioids. Remember when I trained in medicine, what we were trained in is, is that if you're in pain, there is no need to worry about addiction. And in fact, the worst thing to do would be to let somebody stay in pain. So people were actually encouraged to write for these types of medications. When the opioid crisis came to light, that light bulb turned off and people stopped writing them. But what I worried about was how can you take people that were on narcotics or opioids and then overnight say to them, well, guess what? We weren't, you know, your pain's not real and you should learn how to do yoga and mindfulness and you'll be okay. That just simply didn't work. What it did, it turned people to illicit drugs. It turned people into significant behavioral health issues, including suicide. So so this is an area where, again, once again, an immediate crisis forced a different way of doing things. But as opposed to the effort that we put into developing a vaccine, doing large scale testing, now developing, you know, anti antivirals and anti uh, antibodies that you know are coming out for COVID, that didn't happen as much in pain. Now I was part of the White House Opioid Initiative where we were in trying to encourage non-narcotic pain alternatives to be developed. But frankly, the money wasn't put into it. The, the, the mind share wasn't put into it the way we saw with COVID. So we still have this problem in what do we do with chronic pain? And I know it's something that you spend a lot of time on. I will tell you, going back to how we started this interview, that I am attracted to big problems and problems that need solutions. That's why I am very, very engaged to spend a huge amount of time right now on the chronic pain issue, because I believe it's one of the top issues that we need to address in this country. It affects up to 100 million Americans. People's lives are ruined by this. People are not getting the help. And our system is fragmented, siloed, filled with dramatic variation in the quality of offerings being given and lots of snake oil salesmen in mm -hmm. this area. So, so I am very committed to making progress in this. I think that um, digital health, telehealth, brain science, physical therapy, motion, retraining ones, essentially brain circuit, what we call neuroplasticity, are things that do have some evidence there already and are things that we can build upon and need to implement, some of the challenges have to do with the reimbursement system that we talked about. And, and some of it is regulatory, not letting physical therapists practice uh, to the fullest extent that they can. So it really, this problem of chronic pain is very much all about what we've been talking about and very much in the wheelhouse of what I've worked on in the Department of Veteran Affairs, including some pieces of what I learned in the Department of Veteran Affairs that we haven't talked about, like peer support and self-care tools that I think are a very important part of this component in the chronic pain area. When you spoke on that White House Opioid Summit, 
you did a really, because I've seen the video for it and I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes so everyone can watch it. You did a really nice job of kind of distilling, as you mentioned, you like complicated problems and you kind of distilled it down into this one acronym, which is stop pain. And I think the acronym, you know, obviously it speaks to all of us. We all want to stop pain, but you kind of took that acronym and you said, here's an acronym that you can, it helps you understand what's happening with the chronic pain epidemic. And it's something you can use whether you're an individual working in practice or you're a big health system. Can you go through that acronym for us and explain it? Yeah. Uh, you know, the basic idea be behind uh, an acronym is to define the components of what you're trying to address and solve. And the, the issue with uh, the opioid crisis in particular is, is that this needs to be addressed at both a policy level, a medical level, a biopsychosocial psychosocial level, and an economic level. So that this is really the essentially the integration of a different type of model that's usually ap applied to, to medical problems. And so the stop pain really has to do first with S for step care approach, which is uh, you know, not starting with narcotics, but actually starting at the lowest level of intervention that's going to be effective, and then beginning in a methodical way to work to work up um, uh, towards getting adequate pain relief. The T is for treatment alternatives, and it's things like you mentioned, getting people to move more and better with with physical therapy, looking at alternatives that to uh, medications. You know, even. Uh, even things like, um, you know, emotional support dogs, um, you know, and, and addressing some of the biopsychosocial issues that we talked about, like peer support. Um, on the O for stop pain is the ongoing monitoring and usage of a treatment plan, whether it's with medications or not. It's not just start a patient and sort of see how they do. You have to have an effect of ongoing monitoring usage. This is where digital therapeutics mm -hmm. and digital tools actually do help and ensure both adherence, compliance, as well as the effectiveness of the treatment. The P for STOP is practice guidelines. And the Department of Defense and VA have some excellent pain management guidelines, but so do many other organizations. I think that's important. Um, the P for pain is prescription monitoring. So it's important that when you are a physician about to prescribe that you've checked to make sure that other physicians haven't already prescribed. So you're not contributing to the oversupply of medications out there and you address side effects. The A is academic de detailing. That's really education, making sure that our healthcare professionals are knowledgeable. You do a tremendous service by educating your colleagues about the science of chronic pain and pain science. Uh, and I think that's really important. The I is informed consent. This is really about the self-care and the involvement the patient needs to have accountability for their healthcare journey. And so they need to be involved in informed consent whenever a treatment is involved, including taking a medication. The patient has a responsibility not to overuse the medication. And finally, N is naloxone, which is a life-saving way that when people do overdose, unfortunately, we're seeing many, many overdoses continuing, not only with opioids, but with fentanyl and even uh, research that was out as, as early as this week on the side effects and morbidity associated with other pain medications like tramadol. Yeah. Um, that's a great acronym. We're going to include that in the show notes, that stop pain acronym, so people can um, refer to it and use it uh, in their practice, of course. I want to, so you, you mentioned you've done work with, you know, raising people to the highest level scope of their practice. And then you also mentioned peer support. So all of us as licensed healthcare professors have a tremendous amount of education and knowledge. And that peer support sounds like a conduit that all of us can start to use to help people with chronic disease. Yeah, I, I think that's right. But peer support is something even in addition to that. It, it allows people to talk to other people in a way that they have a shared experience, that they understand what somebody's gone through. And maybe it makes sense to people 
who are listening today to understand why that's so powerful for veterans. Because, because veterans tend to think that other people don't understand them. They've not gone through their experiences. But when they hear it from somebody who, who has, their brothers and sisters who have gone through that, it has an impact and it gets through in a way that, that, um, that, that doesn't happen in other ways. And so, so I think when you have, you know, you take somebody with chronic pain who has experienced chronic pain and says, look, let me tell you, I understand what you're going through. I know how hard this is, but here are some ways that I have found that it's been helpful. I think that's extremely powerful. And, it, and in the VA, it's what I call the superpower of the VA, this ability to have people supporting one another who have these shared experiences. Secretary Shulkin, it's been an honor speaking with you today. And thank you for all the information that you shared. Of course, everyone can find this, all, all the information on the links at the show notes at the Integrated Pain Science Institute. Where can people learn more about you and the things you're up to? Well, uh, first of all, I encourage people to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter at David Shulkin and you find me on LinkedIn and uh, I have a website, Shulkin Solutions, and um, uh, I love to interact with people. So feel free to reach out. Great. So we'll link to the um, URL there. It's shulkinsolutions.com. And at the end of every podcast, I ask you to share this with your friends and family on social media or everyone's talking about how to treat chronic pain safely and effectively. Again, I want to thank Secretary Shulkin for joining us this week, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.